Okay, I think I, I have started recording, so it's time so we can start. Well, welcome everyone to uh, the uh, virtual seminar on geometry with symmetry. So this is our first talk after a uh, summer break. And uh, our uh, speaker today is uh, Philip uh, Heiser for, from the University of uh, Fribourg. And he's going to talk about twisted suspensions, storage actions, and positive Ricci curvature. So uh, thank you, Philip. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, thanks for the invitation. And yeah, thank you all for coming. And um, yeah, please feel free whenever you have a comment or question to interrupt me anytime. Um, yeah, so I want to um, discuss this, what's called twisted suspension. So this is motivated by um, relatively vague question. So given a smooth manifold of seven dimension n, can we take this manifold and construct a new manifold of this of one dimension higher so that the new manifold has some similar properties and similar in terms of topology of geometry or also in terms of symmetries. Um, of course, there are many possible things one could do. So an obvious Candidate would be just take a product with an S1. Um, this might work, but for the for the goal we have in mind later on, uh, this is not very uh, suitable. For example, the fundamental group can change drastically, so we, we get an additional set summoned. Um, so so we will not consider this. Another option would be the topological suspension. So we call this is just a product with an interval, and then we collapse both endpoints. However, this is just not a manifold. Whenever the manifold we start with is not a sphere. So this is also not suitable. But what we will actually consider is what we call the manifold suspension. And it's also called the spinning of M. Um, for that, we Intuitively, we do the same as taking the product with an S1. And then we, uh, we sort of fill in the, the additional, we, we remove this additional Z generator. So um, we, we take an embedded disk into the manifold. And the disk theorem of Palais actually tells us this is unique up to isotopy. And we also need to consider orientations. But after that, it's unique. And then what we do is we, we cut out this disk. And we take the product. With an S1. This gives us a manifold with boundary. This boundary is an n minus one sphere across this S1. And then we glue in the n minus one sphere across a two disk. So for those who are familiar, this is basically a, a surgery on the S1 here in the product. So um, <clears throat> to visualize this, I, I tried to, to draw some pictures. Um, generally, the problem is we just don't have enough dimensions, so we cannot draw any meaningful pictures, but I draw, uh, try to uh, visualize this here. So um, if this is our starting manifold, we cut out the disk. Then we rotate it once around, and this gives us a hole in the middle. And we fill in this hole by this, in this case, it's a blue disk cross an S1. So um, there's one case where we can actually draw uh, a good picture, namely the case where our manifold is one-dimensional. So it's an S1. Then uh, our embedded disk is just a, a one disk, so just a segment in the circle. So we cut it out. Um, then we rotate it around the S1. So I hope you can see it here. This is our segment we started with, and then we rotate it once around. And then the boundary is um, see these two circles. So we have basically two holes in the manifold. So uh, the disjoint of two two disks, and this is the same as a zero sphere across a two disk. And then we fit it in. And, uh, and I hope you can see this. We just get a two sphere. So we saw the suspension of a, of a one sphere gives us a two sphere. And we'll see later this generally holds for, for our standard n spheres. So where the suspension of, a, of an n sphere gives an n plus one sphere. 
Um, yeah, so you can of course ask why do we call this suspension? So generally we will see later that because a lot of the topological properties are preserved and because it maps spheres to spheres, this is in some sense a smooth analog of the classical suspension. Um, in the previous picture, maybe one can also see if we consider this part with maybe the, the upper part and the lower part removed, so we, we cut maybe here and here, this is just a product of a connected sum of M with itself with orientation reversed. So yeah, sort of this slice and then it's a product of it. And then for the classical suspension, we would just collapse both endpoints to a point. And in this case, we sort of glue in something so that it's smooth. Um, so it's rather a suspension of, of a connected sum of M with itself. Okay, um, before I tell some, some more properties, let me give you um, a uh, generalization of this. So instead of taking just a product with an S1, we can take a principal S1 bundle. So um, this is just a, a bundle where we have uh, an S1 action on the total space, which is free. And so that it's, it preserves the fibers and it's transitive on each fibers. You can think of it as a unit sphere bundle on a complex line bundle. Um, so such a bundle is uniquely characterized by its Euler class. So it's a cohomology class in the second cohomology of M. And it's important to note here that um, conversely, also every class can be realized and it also um, defines the bundle uniquely. And then what we do now, we use that, I mean, the, the bundle globally might not be a product, but locally it is. So we take a local trivialization, so embedding of an N disk in the base across the fiber, which is an S1. Again, by the disk theorem of Palais, this is unique up to isotopy. And then we cut out this part. Again, we get a boundary that is an n minus one sphere cross an S1. And we glue in an n minus one sphere cross a two disk. And this is what we then call the twisted suspension. Um, yeah. So these are the two suspensions. So we only cross. The Euler class determines the bundle uniquely. We only need to remember the specific class and not the bundle. And then this fits very well with this suspension we started with, because if we take E equal to zero, we have the trivial bundle, and then this is just the same as up here. So let me give you a quick history of this construction. So the earliest, earliest article where I could find this is in a Spiar team. Uh, almost 100 years ago. So he, he introduced the concept of knot spinning. So if you think of a knot as an embedded S1 in a three sphere, you can apply this spinning operation to both simultaneously, so to the three sphere and to the embedded S1. And this then gives an embedded two sphere in the four sphere. And in some cases, it's easier to analyze these higher dimensional manifolds to say something about the, the lower dimension manifolds. And this was done by our team to, uh, to analyze certain knots by doing the spinning operation. And this then later became a, a tool in, in knot theory and got extended and generalized in various ways. And it also got generalized to manifolds in this way. So there is probably a very incomplete list, but um, there are works by Epstein, Kappel, Gordon, and Suchu. Then, in a recent paper by Duan, this spinning appears um, under the name of suspension. And there he studied free circle actions, um, particularly the diffeomorphism type of certain manifolds with free circle actions. And there it very naturally appears. So this is the first time this suspension appears. And then together with Fernando, we generalized Duan's results we were also studying free circle actions, and we call this the twisted suspension. Okay. What are some properties of this? So first of all, this is what we wanted. Some, some topological properties stay the same. So for example, the fundamental group stays the same. 
Um, also, the second cohomology, second homology, provided the manifold is simply connected with uh, respect to any coefficient ring. Um, then, this is uh, quite interesting. So, the twisted suspension is a spin manifold if and only if the second Stiefel Rednik class of what we started with is the same as the reduction of this class E12. So in particular, if the second cohomology is sufficiently complicated or sufficiently non-trivial, then we can just choose if this is spin or not by simply choosing the right class E. Um, yeah, as I said earlier, if we take the suspension of a standard sphere, we get a standard sphere. And more generally, uh, it preserves the property of being a homology sphere with respect to any coefficient ring. Then another property is it uh, behaves nicely with uh, connected sums. So for that, you have to know that uh, the second cohomology of the connected sum is, is naturally or canonically isomorphic to the sum of the second cohomologies of each, each summit. So um, a cohomology class in each summit gives uh, a cohomology class in the connected sum and vice versa. And then it just simply commutes the connected sum operator. Okay, so these are all the logical properties that are preserved. Um, then with respect to symmetries, we can actually lift torus actions. So if we start with an effective action of the torus, the manifold, um, we need some additional properties. Namely, we need a fixed point and we need vanishing first cohomology. Then we can lift this action and actually we get one more dimension for the torus. This comes from the additional uh, S1 action on the, on the principal bundle. And so we get a TK plus one action on the twisted suspension. So we will see later on this, this construction. This will be important. And then finally, with respect to geometry, we can ask, can we lift some geometric properties along the twisted suspension? Um, and this is what I would like to discuss next. So the geometric properties I want to consider are lower bounds on the Ricci curvature. So a quick review. Given the Riemannian manifold, the Ricci curvature is a partial average of the section curvatures. So we fix a tangent vector of unit length, and then the Ricci curvature of this vector is this average of sectional curvature. So we average over all two planes that contain this direction. So EI is here just an orthonormal basis of the orthogonal complement. And so this is, one would say, one of the main um, curvature notions in Riemannian geometry. And um, widely studied and very important question is, given a manifold, can we find a Riemannian metric on this manifold so, such that the Ricci curvature is, is positive everywhere? <laughs> Sorry. So and <clears throat> an important approach to this question is, if we have some sort of topological construction, and we start with a Riemannian metric <clears throat> of positive Ricci curvature, can we preserve this under the construction? For example, we can the, take the suspension operation. Then it was shown by Shang Yang that if we start with a manifold, which is closed and of dimension at least three, that has a metric of positive Ricci curvature, then uh, the suspension or the spinning also emits a Riemannian metric of positive Ricci curvature. And then our first main result is that uh, exactly the same statement holds if we replace the spinning or the suspension by the twisted suspension. And this holds for any cohomology class we choose here. A small remark, in fact, we can draw a little bit more, namely the connected sum with as many copies of S2 plus Sn minus 1 as we want. It's a Riemannian metric of positive Ricci curvature. This will be important later. Uh, so this just comes from, I mean, we, we did a, the surgery operation um, along a local trivialization of the principal bundle, but we can also take multiple disjoint local trivializations. And the effect is then this, what we get is this connected sum. 
Okay. So let's consider the proof of this theorem. So um, we take this principal bundle whose, whose Euler class is given by E. So the first step is to construct a metric of positive or at least non-negative Ricci curvature on the total space. So this metric is of this form. So, so pi here is the bundle projection. So we pull back the metric from the, from the base. And we add an additional term for that. Maybe I should say this first. So the fibers here are one-dimensional. And we actually have a, a vector field, a non-managing vector field tangent to the fibers. This is given by this, this is the action field. Um, simply given by the, at the point, we apply the action and we differentiate it at zero. And so the, the bundle generated by this vector field is called the vertical distribution. And then any sub-bundle that is complementary to this is called a horizontal distribution. And we, we define this metric on each part separately. So this is on the vertical part. This on the horizontal part. So this we can always define, and here we have to specify additional data. So this A is a connection form. This means it's identically one of, on our vector field DT. And we also want it to be S1 invariant. Uh, and this phi is just a, a scaling factor. And then the horizontal distribution we pick is just the orthogonal complement with respect to this metric, um, which also is just a kernel of the swap form. Yeah, so the, the data we need here is the, the metric from the base, um, which tells us what happens on the horizontal part. And we need this connection form, which actually tells us what the horizontal part exactly is. So we need it here in this definition. And then, to simplify notation later on, we simply identify vector fields, horizontal vector fields that are S1 invariant um, with vector fields on the base simply by applying the projection. Okay, so this is the metric we consider. Now, the Ricci curvatures of this have been computed. So this goes back to work by Vera Bercheri and also by Gilkeep Park Tushman. So here the T is just a normalized um, uh, vertical vector, X and Y are horizontal vectors. And we also have an F appearing here. This is the, the curvature form. So this is the differential of the connection form. Um, since the curvature form is a S1 invariant and it's also trivial on the vertical part, we can just identify it by project projecting it down with a, with a form on the base so that these expressions make sense. Um, so we see here, we always have this, this factor depending on phi here, here, and here. And we have this Ricci curvature, which we assume to be positive. And also this norm is at least non-negative. So we, by just scaling down so by making phi very small, we can make this part very small and this part very small. Uh, also this part, but um, in order to get something strictly positive or non-negative, um, this is not sufficient. We need to know exactly what this is. But it's a nice thing. So this is maybe a special instance of John Weil theory. So the, uh, the, the Ram cohomology class up to some normalization of the curvature form is exactly the Euler class. And conversely, also, we can realize any form that represents the Euler class as a curvature form. So we have quite a, yeah, we can say precisely what we want as the curvature form. And now we can apply the Hopf theorem, which tells us that there is harmonic representative of every cohomology class. And harmonic means that delta of the form is zero. So exactly this term here. So if we pick, the connection form such that the curvature form is harmonic, 
then this mixed part is identically zero. And then we just make phi very small, so that this is small, and also this is small, and then the, the Ricci curvature is at least not negative. Okay, so this is our metric on the total space, which we uh, so uh, which we now have, where we now have non-negative Ricci character. Um, so now, but now we need to do the surgery. So how do we do that? So first of all, for local trivialization, we uh, we modify the metric on the base, namely we modify it on a very small, um, a very small metric ball, so that it's isometric to the round metric. Sphere. So this we can always do this. This this epsilon might be very small, but we, we can always do that in a small level. And we can write this round metric as a bulk product, I mean ds squared plus sine squared of s, and then the round metric of a lower dimensional sphere. And now the idea is instead of removing this part and gluing something else in, we take what we have here and, and modify it. In such a way that the topology changes in this way. So, so we identify this this small neighborhood with um, an interval across an n minus one sphere, where we collapse the sphere at the at zero. And so the idea is on this part where the metric is of the swap product form, we just pick a different warping function which does not go to zero when s goes to zero. And now when we take the, the whole metric on the, on the total space, which over the small neighborhood we identify with, with an interval across an n minus one sphere, across an S1, we um, take this, um, again, this connect, uh, another connection form, and we also warp it by some warping function. And now we make sure that this warping function vanishes at zero. So before we had that this part collapses at zero, so that this gives us a, a, an n disk cross an S1, and now we sort of reverse it. So we make sure that this part collapses, so this together then gives a two disk, and if it, that doesn't collapse, this gives an n minus one sphere. Okay, but there are a lot of things we need to make sure. We need to make sure this is a smooth metric, actually. It glues smoothly with our original metric on P, and we still we want positive Ricci coverage. Yeah, this is what I just said. Okay, so this is the metric we have. So this is a smooth metric if it's not necessary, but it's sufficient. So if this connection form is just dt, so that this is then just a w of product, dn is equal zero. Um, we want that h vanishes at zero, it's, and that its derivative is one at zero. Um, strictly speaking, we also need conditions on higher derivatives, but um, this can always be achieved by some, uh, some local smoothing. And we need um, that f is is positive at zero and has vanishing derivative at zero. And then also conditions on higher derivatives. So these are the boundary conditions at zero. And we want that it glues smoothly with our metric on P. So we need that, um, that this new connection form glues smoothly with the original one. And then again, this is not necessary, but it's sufficient that the warping function here is the original sine function and since we uh, we change this 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 parameter a bit, we need to shift this a bit. But it's just the the sine function, and that h is at least um, has this value e to the phi and has vanishing derivative. And it, again, we need also some conditions on higher derivatives. But this is uh, this is no problem. Okay, so these are the boundary conditions our functions need to satisfy. So they would look some somewhat like this. So h originally was constant e to the phi, and now it goes to zero. And f before was some sine function here, and now it needs to go like this to a positive value with vanishing derivative. So how do we do this? Well, we 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 write down some functions and show that they do what they should do. 
So let's maybe consider rigid curvature in S direction. So this is then just um, depends on the second derivative of these functions. And then something depending on the, on the curvature form. So here we see, because H bends down, it has negative second derivative. So we have a positive contribution here. F bends up. So um, we have a positive second derivative, which is a negative contribution. And since we have squares here, this is also negative. So this is a bit um, a, a delicate construction because we need to make sure that this H term um, dominates these terms, but we, we cannot bend it too much because otherwise we, we end up with a negative derivative. Then, so the, the solution here is we write down some, some differential equations. So it's it's maybe not important what exactly these uh, these equations are, but um, we can give some some initial value problems and um, define f and h as a solution of them. Actually, h is the derivative of f up to some normalization, and then we can actually show that we 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 don't have explicit um, explicit uh, formulae for these uh, functions, but we can show that the second derivative of h over h is up to a factor the same as that of, uh, of f. Uh, so this is very nice. And so we can just plug it in here. And by choosing this, this parameter alpha in the right way, we get this to be positive. And then we have another parameter, which is called lambda 0. And we can also show that with this definition that the derivative converges to lambda 0. So if we uh, pick it, uh, above cosine of epsilon, we can achieve that this slope gets big enough so that we can afterwards bend it down the sine function. And then we only need to take care of this term. And for that, we just make h very small. We just bend, we, we scale it down. Um, and then this gets very small. This is scaling invariant, so this is no problem. Um, we had this, this condition on the derivative here as equals zero. For that, we have to modify slightly as, as, as at s equals zero, um, but this is also not a problem. We can do that. Um, yeah. And then we get the solution to this. We also, of course, need to consider other Ricci curvatures, but there it's a, it's a similar argument. And then, so this glues smoothly with our original metric. Then we get a metric of non-negative Ricci curvature on the, on the whole space. And we have strictly positive Ricci curvature on where we did the surgery. And then there are general um, uh, deformation results due to Aubin and Ehrlich, um, which allow to smooth the whole, uh, to deform the whole uh, metric into a metric of strictly positive Ricci curvature everywhere. Okay, so that finishes the proof. Okay. Um, so I want to discuss a few um, applications of this. So the first one is a symmetry rank. So um, this question was discussed by, by Ko Galas Garcia and also by Moyer. So given a fixed dimension n, uh, what is the largest possible dimension of a torus that can act uh, effectively and isometrically in a close, simply connected Riemannian? Manifold of positive rich curvature in this dimension. So, this is, uh, of course, you can ask this for any, any curvature condition. And this goes back to, uh, to um, questions on positive sectional curvature. And this um, is then called a symmetry rank. And it uh, was introduced and studied by Gover Searle. But of course, you can also ask this for, for rich curvature. So, uh, I think this is not standard, but I just note, use this notation. Then maybe I say it first for, for dimension two and three, this is this is not difficult. It's just n minus one because we just have the two sphere and the three sphere. And but from dimension four, it's um it's a more a bit less clear. So there we have this two-sided inequality. So we know it's at least n minus four and at most n minus two. So this, this upper bound um, goes back to, to work by Park and Parker because 
uh, if it were n minus one, this would mean we would have a cohomogeneity one action of a torus. And then they showed that this would mean that the manifold actually has an infinite fundamental group. And in particular, it's not simply connected. And therefore, it's at most n minus two. Um, and then it was shown by Ko Galas Garcia that uh, it's at least n minus four, and that they considered um, some principal torus bundles over some, some four manifolds with sufficiently large second platinum and constructed explicit examples in each of these dimensions. Then, in some cases, we know that this here we actually have an equality. Namely in dimension four, five, and six. So there we can consider just a standard action of T4 on an S3 cos S3. So we have the standard T2 action of an S3, where we consider S3 as uh, embedded in C2. And we can just take the, the round metric on each sphere and have this have an isometric action. Uh, so this is in dimension six, and we have a free T2 subaction here, so we can take quotients, so we get down to dimension five and four. Um, now, by using this, this twisted suspension operation, we can now show that this we have equality here actually in all dimensions. So, yeah, so we have that it's equal to n minus two. Uh, we can even say a bit more, namely, we can choose some of the topological properties we want. So we can prescribe the second Betty number. So we can choose any second Betty number we want. We need this to be even in dimension four, but otherwise we can choose it as we want. And also if we have sufficiently uh, non-trivial uh, second cohomology, we can also choose if it's a spin manifold or a non-spin manifold. So in particular in each dimension, we get an infinite family of such manifolds with, with maximal symmetry rank. So to prove this, uh, we will use an equivariant version of the, of the main theorem of theorem A. Namely, uh, it says if we start with an effective and isometric TK action, then also supposing we have L fixed points, then we can lift positive Ricci curvature to the, to the implicit suspension. And then we have again this connected sum with product of S2 and Sn minus 1. Um, and when we can, the, the, the method of Porter Ricci curve should be obtained, is then again invariant under this lifted action of, of Tk plus one. So here's a quick sketch of the proof. So the proof is the same as I just presented. Just We just need to make sure in every step that we uh, carry along the, the action so that in every step, the metric is again invariant under the action. Um, and we only do it for L equal to one. So we only do one surgery, and then the general statement follows by doing L surgeries. So first we have, because we have positive Ricci curvature, we have a finite fundamental group, in particular vanishing first cohomology. And then there's a result by Sue, which says we can lift the torus action to the total space, such that it commutes with the, the action of the S1 on the total space, which we have from the principal bundle structure. And then we can combine these two, the uh, k torus and the, the one torus to get a k plus one torus acting effectively on the total space. Now, this, this metric we constructed on the total space will then again be uh, invariant under the action, as long as this connection form we chose is invariant under the action. Um, so we have to remember we, we chose this form so that its curvature form is harmonic. And it actually turns out because this is basically this, this harmonic form is unique, um, that this is invariant under the action. So the so for the metric on P, this is fine. And then we use that we have a um, fixed point, and then we uh, we did this metric deformation. So we do this metric deformation for the local trivialization around the fixed point. And this gives that the local trivialization is invariant under the action. And then uh, we just check that um, everything 
um, works nicely with the action. And this is the case. So uh, we can sort of carry it through the surgery and this, this connection form we choose needs to be invariant and then the whole metric is invariant. And since we had a lot of freedom in choosing this, this is also not a problem. Okay. So let's go back to the original theorem. Okay, so how do we construct these examples? So the first step is we consider S3 with the round metric, and um, we consider an S1 action on S3. So we consider S3 as contained in C2. And now we consider this action. So we, we do not act on both factors. We only um, act on the first one. Uh, this is still linear, so it's still an isometric action. But uh, now we have fixed points. This is what we wanted. So the fixed point set is all points where the first coordinate is zero. So this is a, a whole S1. In particular, we have infinitely many fixed points. So we can choose any, any number L we wanted here. So we can apply this theorem in this case. And we obtain that the suspension. So here, here we could just pick E equals zero because we just have no second cohomology we can take. Um, so we have the suspension here and then connected sum your copies of S2 cross S2. And we saw earlier that uh, the suspension of a sphere is again a sphere. So it's just a force sphere here. And since connected sum with a standard sphere is just doesn't change the manifold, we can just uh, remove it. So this is just a connected sum of copies of S2 cross S2. And the theorem tells us that we have an T, a T2 invariant metric of positive Ricci curvature on the space for any L. So this proves the theorem already in, uh, uh, in dimension four and also shows why we need that uh, K is even. Okay, and now we can specifically look at the action or we can use some, some Euler characteristic uh, arguments and see that this action has two L fixed points. So we can apply the theorem again. So we can define this manifold M E L prime. So it's a, now the twisted suspension for some class in the second cohomology of this connected sum. So now we have a lot of possible choices for this uh, because we have a possibly very big second Betty number. And then, so we take this twisted suspension and we take this additional summon we had before. So summons products of S2 plus S3 in this case. And because we have two L fixed points, we need that this L prime is at most two L. And then we obtain this now as a T3 invariant metric of positive Ricci curvature. So this now then, uh, Okay, so the, the second Betty number then is the, the second Betty number of this, because what we saw earlier, the second Betty number is preserved under the twisted suspension. So it's 2L minus 2 plus this contribution, so L prime minus 1. And we saw also earlier that uh, this is a spin manifold if and only if the second Stiefel Ruidner class of the of this manifold, which is 0. Uh, is the mod two reduction of the uh, this Euler class. So this is because this is zero here. It's a spin manifold if and only if the Euler class has even divisibility. So in particular, we can just uh, we can achieve this if we want. So we we can just prescribe the value of the second Betty number and of the second Stiefel Wittner class. Um, uh, provided that we have non-trivial second cohomology. So this then proves um, the theorem in dimension five. Okay, and now we could just continue, take uh, further suspensions, or alternative, alternatively, we, uh, a bit simpler, we can take a principal torus bundle over the manifold such that the, the total space is simply connected. And then we can always lift positive Ricci curvature, and we can also lift, um, as we saw before, um, the symmetries along this lift. 
So this goes back to Vicky Park Tushman. And um, so there, there are topological restrictions for the existence of such a bundle, namely the second Betty number. So the, the, the dimension of the torus can be at most the second Betty number of the base. And then the second Betty number of the total space um, is then the, that of the base. So, and we have to subtract the dimension of the torus. But uh, this is all no problem because uh, we can use this second Betty number as big as we want. Yeah, and, and therefore we can just prescribe also the second Betty number of the of the total space. And also by um, specifying um, the bundle in the right way and by choosing this manifold to be spin or not, we can also choose if P is spin or not. So we can also prescribe the, the second Schlegel gradient class. And so we get to, to arbitrary dimension. And this uh, proves the theorem. Uh, one remark. So we can actually say what the manifolds are topologically. So the, the suspension over this connected sum of products of spheres is again a product a connected sum of products of spheres, um, or a connected sum of of uh, copies of of sphere bundles. So this denotes the unique non-trivial linear S3 bundle over S2. So there are precisely two um, linear sphere bundles over S2, and this denotes the non-trivial. So this is the non-spin case. And then when we go to higher dimensions, when we take this, this principal bundle, this will be diffeomorphic again to a connected sum of products of spheres, but there the summons can be can be different, kind of different um, sphere uh, factors. Or possibly one non-trivial bundle. So here we have the non-trivial linear S n minus two bundle over S2. Um, yeah, this is what I showed with together with the um, yeah, so these um, so which factors appear, which summons appear, is uniquely determined by the second second better number and the second Stiefel Rigner class. So all these manifolds are just connected sums of products of spheres, or possibly one non-trivial bundle if the manifold is not spin. So in particular, these manifolds were already uh, known to, to have a metric of positive Ricci curvature. So this is due to work by by it goes back to work by Shah and Young. Uh, David Wraith and also Bradley Burdick. Um, but what's new here is that we can construct these invariant metrics. Okay, then um, another application I want to present uh, homology spheres. So we can, so this is just to construct new examples of manifolds with positive Ricci curvature without considering um, symmetries now. So for example, we can construct rational homology spheres, whether, uh, which are non simply connected, but where all other uh, homology groups vanish. And we can also construct some examples with, with some more complicated fundamental group, which are then here, it's an integral homology sphere. And the fundamental group is the, the binary equosavery group. So the a perfect group of one and the elements. And the, the proof is rather short. So in the first case, we take uh, twisted suspensions over length spaces. And here, the, the Euler class um, is a, just a generator. So the second uh, cohomology of a length space with fundamental loop set not k is just set not k. And then we just take a primitive element. And then we can calculate. We know from before the fundamental loop stays the same. Um, a length space is a rational homology sphere, so we end up with a rational homology sphere. And because this is a generator, one can show that these integral homology groups actually vanish. And for the second one, we take the Poincaré homology sphere and we just take the standard suspensions n minus three times. And because the binary equosedral group is a fundamental group of the Poincaré homology sphere, um, this is preserved along, along the suspension. Okay, and uh, still have a bit of time. So uh, final application. 
So it's motivated by the following question. Given some natural number and some, uh, some finitely generated abelian group, can we construct a closed Riemannian manifold of positive region curvature whose, whose homology group uh, in this degree is, is isomorphic to the, to the group we, we chose? So for i equals one, there's an obstruction. So we can do that if and only if if um, this group is, is finite. So obstruction simply comes from the theorem of Bonnie Myers. But um, uh, conversely, we actually cons can construct any finite group as a as a fundamental group. This, this simply follows from the fact that um, any finite group is a subgroup of a symmetric group, and every symmetric group is a subgroup of some SUN for some n. And then we SUN has a metric of positive Ricci curvature. So any bi-invariant metric will have positive Ricci curvature. And then we can take the quotient by this finite group and obtain the manifold with this fundamental group. Uh, if we are only interested in the homology and not the fundamental group, we also can just take some suitable products of length spaces. They will also be the problem. OK. One degree higher. This is as far as I know, it's, it's open. There are examples of, of course, if it's torsion free, um, we can realize any group. But as soon as, as we have torsion, of course, there are examples where the second homology has torsion, but um, I'm not aware of any anything uh, classification of this. And then in degree three, it was shown by crawling Wraith that every actually any two connected seven manifold has a metric of positive Ricci curvature. And um, it follows from the classification of these manifolds that actually any finally generated abelian group can be realized as the third homology group of such a manifold. And therefore, um, since they all have positive Ricci curvature, this uh, answers this question in degree three. So here we, we can realize any. And then by taking some products, or actually you can also take some um, suspensions, this carries over to add all higher degrees. Um, what I want to discuss here is an alternative proof of this. So given any finally generated abelian group, so we can write it in this form. So this is the torsion part, and this is the free part. Then in any um, any uh, so there he is missing that this m should be odd. Uh, no, sorry. So m is any manifold, and then we consider odd dimension two and plus one. So we start in dimension seven. We can construct a closed simply connected Riemannian manifold of positive Ricci curvature, whose third homology group is exactly this group. And we can also say what the what the other uh, cohomology groups are. So there's a rational cohomology ring of connected some of these products of spheres. So it's a rather simple uh, cohomology ring. So how do we prove this? <clears throat> so um, we know the second cohomology group of a CPM is, is set. So we pick a generator and the, we will take twisted suspensions. And the classes we take are just this Ki times this generator. So then we take the connected sum these twisted suspensions. So we do this L1 times so as many factors as we, have, as we have here. And then we take L2 times, so the free part, a uh, normal suspension of an untwisted suspension of S2 cross S2 and minus two. And from before we know this suspension commutes with the, with the connected sum. So we can write this as suspension of the, this connected sum. And now, if we analyze the topology of this, so uh, since this is simply connected, the manifold is simply connected, um, we also know the, the second, so that the, the second homology is preserved if we start with something simply connected. So um, this is the same as the second homology of CPM, which is that. And then we can calculate, this is because of this choice, Euler class, the third uh, homology group is set on Ki. Um, also, the 
um, the, the other uh, homology groups are all approached with this ausgenome. And for the, the other part here, we actually know what this is up to diffeomorphism, namely this is just a connected sum of these two draw up spheres. So putting this together, we have, we we see that this is this has these required properties. So the torsion part comes from these factors, and the, the free part uh, comes from this S three each each summit. And then we we need a metric of positive Ricci curvature. Um, and here we just use what we've proven before. So we know this manifold has a metric of positive Ricci curvature. And therefore, we can lift it to the, to the suspension here. Okay. That's, that's all I want to say. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Philip, for this very nice uh, talk. So yeah, maybe we have uh, time for, for questions. So. Can I ask a question? Please, yeah. Can you hear me? Philip, this is Wolfgang. Uh, that was a beautiful talk. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you. I had some questions uh, about dimension four. So if I understand correctly, you get these metrics only on connected sums of S2 cos S2 with itself, our terrain times. Mm -hmm. So one question would be, how uh, different is that metric from the Sha Yang, met Sha Yang metric, which are also doubly walled? And then the second question would be, you can do this also if you take further connected sums with CP2 and CP2 bar, again, only with S1 symmetry. But if I understand correctly in dimension four, at least, you can't get to T2 symmetry on these examples. That's an old question, open question, if that also can be done with T2 symmetry in dimension four. Do you understand um, for, for, for arbitrary connected sums of CP2 minus CP2? Yeah. OK, so, so for, the, for the first question, in fact, um, back. so this is precisely, actually, the, the, the metric on this S2 cross S2, these connected sums, is precisely the Shayang metric. So they showed simply they, they showed that there exists a metric of positive Ricci. Um, the, the new thing maybe here is that to observe that these metrics are actually T-Crew invariant. So their old examples are T2 invariant? Um, there are their examples on these connected sums of S2 uh, across S2. Oh. These okay. are one and only saw a circle symmetry, but not a T2 symmetry. That's interesting. Okay. Yes. So the, the one sort of the obvious one is from the taking a product with an S1, but then that we can can lift this S1 action from the from the S3. This is maybe the, the new thing here. Yeah, so this is precisely the, the Shagan matrix. Um, and for the for the other question, I, I don't know. So because the so we know these connected sums of CP2 and minus CP2, they have positive Ricci curvature. Um, as far as I know, so the, these construct these are constructed very, very differently. So I'm not aware of any any method to, to uh, get some some symmetries on those. So there's one approach by, by Perelman where we can freely pick how many summons we, we, we take. Right. This might be uh, very difficult to get some symmetries there. Then there's some, some work by Sha Yang where they start with one CP2 and one minus CP2 and then do some surgeries um, to get additional summons with S2 cross S2, which is then diffeomorphic to CP2, uh, connect some minus CP2. Um, connect some How much symmetry these examples have? Uh, I don't know. So then maybe that one has better chances to get some symmetry, but um, uh, it's 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 more difficult than than here, I guess. But I didn't check. Nice. I don't know. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very pretty results. Thank you. Thank you for your questions, Volking. Uh, uh, so, are there other questions? Um... So maybe a quick question. So what about like other like positive like K positive Ricci curvature? I mean, can you do do that? Yeah, that's that that would be nice. Um so 
Um, so they're doing this suspension, so preserving the course of reach here along the suspension. This is very much uses very much tools for specifically for positive Ricci. So in, in particular, the, the metrics constructed there in the theorem B, they, uh, they only have positive Ricci and nothing, nothing more. Um, so one, there might possibly be a, a way to get some Ricci K, but this would involve uh, much more work and um, so when we lift along these torus bundles, it might be possible to lift a Ricci K where K doesn't, doesn't go up in the same way as the dimension. Um, but this is this is much less clear. Yeah, of course, this the symmetry rank questions you, you can ask by Ricci K. And as far as I know, you have some upper bounds, but you don't know if they are um, if there are actually examples that achieve this upper bound. Um, yeah, so unfortunately, there's no no obvious way to generalize these constructions to to um, to reach UK. But yeah, perhaps there's something I don't know. Okay. Okay. Well, so if there are no uh, further questions, thank you, Philip, for this very nice talk, and for uh, thank you everyone for for joining and i hope we see you in the next uh, uh talk in the in the seminar geometry with with symmetries so thank you so thank you